So anyways, today we're gonna to be talking about how we can traverse a graph. Now, before I can do that, I have to define what a graph traversal is. So just please keep this in mind. So let's talk about what a graph traversal is. So I'm just going to keep it rather high level, keep it simple for us. It's simply a process of starting of starting at a vertex u in the set of vertices in the graph. And processing all the vertices and edges. Now here comes the terminology here. I'm going to talk about it a bit more. All the vertices and edges reachable from you. I'm not talking about like you. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about that you <laughs> right there. <laughs> so let me do an example here. I really want to explain what this idea of reachable means. So let me draw you a picture. Just get rid of this marker here. It's gone. <laughs> so let's, uh, let me draw you a fun picture of a graph here. <laughs> So let's draw out a graph here. We have A, B, C, D, E, H, and F and G at the bottom here. So we've got ourselves here a graph, a nice and simple one, I think. Like I must stress that this is an undirected graph, but I must stress that the concepts I'm going to talk about here, it doesn't matter if it's a directed graph or undirected graph. But the point is, is, suppose I have some vertex U. Suppose A is U. Not, not U, but that U over there. So suppose that I look at this. And now, in a previous lesson, I talked about how what, what a path is. So remember, it's just a sequence of vertices for which each one of the vertices in the pathway are connected by an incident edge. So I have to go from one vertex that's adjacent to another one. So for example, a, B, and C is a path, or in this case, it's just simply A, B, and C is a path. Nice, it's, and we call it simple if there's no repeating vertices. So notice here that I can, from A, I can get to H, I can get to B, I can get to C, following some pathway, right? Notice I can also get even down to G here by going do, 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 down like that. See, so there's a lot of pathways I could take, right? Now, the question is, okay, so what does it mean to be reachable? Now, suppose that I introduced you another vertex here. Suppose I introduce vertex i. Now, vertex i is isolated here. Do you notice it doesn't have any incident edges? There's no, there's no edges that connect it to any one of these other vertices. So that i, there is no path from i to any of the other vertices. So that implies that this actually is the case that you can't reach it from U, right? Because there is no path from A to I. So we would say that, for example, all of these edges that form this connected component right here, with the exception of I, because I is not reachable from A or U, right? <laughs> so, so that's what I mean by reachable. So it means that there exists a path that comprises those vertices or those edges. So what a graph traversal for us will mean is that you have some starting vertex and you ask the question of, can you, we would like to process all the vertices and edges that are reachable from that vertex. And very naturally, you might ask, where is this go? Like, suppose I want to process the entire graph. Suppose the graph doesn't actually, so I wanted to get to like, I want to process I too. 
So that would mean that you need to restart this process, so like bootstrap this process, so that you start off at i again. So I'll talk more about this in a little bit, okay? So the, we're going to start very basic right now. Now, there's a, at least a couple different ways you can explore a graph. Now, you might ask, Dan, what does it mean to process a graph? Well, what I mean by processing is that we would like to be able to mark vertices. So I would like to put, be able to go like this, like, oh, suppose I want to visit that vertex. I'm going to call that a mark. I would like to mark vertices, and I would like to label edges. So if I can do that for everything reachable from you, I'll consider that processing the graph. So naturally, uh, you might ask, Dan, how efficiently can you do this? Now, if you have direct access to those objects, as per some discussion we've had previously, each of these, you, there are ways to represent the graph so that both of these mechanisms can be done in constant time. Because you just have access to them. <laughs> so you usually you'll have some data structure underlying that is representing these edge, the edges and vertices, so that you have some mechanism to say label them or mark them respectively. So I'll just presume that there's some ability to label the edges and marking the vertices. Nice and simple, right? So that's what I mean by processing. So you might ask, okay, so where are we going to go with this? So I, just because we're going to be going on an adventure, I better put my hat on. Let me get my hat on. <clears throat> there we go. I got my discovery hat on. We're going to be going on an adventure. Naturally, I need to be able to do that. Because you know the hat makes it all legitimate, right? <laughs> so... The first way we're going to look at how we can explore a graph or network is what we call depth first search. We're going to talk about depth first search, which I'll abbreviate as DFS. So a very natural question is, okay, so how can we do this? This idea of processing all the vertices and edges reachable from you. So the first thing I like to do I like to think of the graph almost like a maze, right? So think of the graph like a maze. So think of the graph like a maze, a labyrinth. A labyrinth where we have the following. Where what I want to do is I want to use my imagination. I want to imagine that these vertices, each one of them is going to end up being, think of it like an intersection or a dead end. And you can think of the edge as like corridor. So you just imagine this like some big maze where these are like the intersections or dead ends in the pathways. The edges just as corridors. So the vertices, are intersections and or dead ends in the maze. And you can think of the edges like the passages that connect those. So the edges are passages. So so naturally, you might say, okay, so now if, so Dan, why are we going into this? So I want to tell you a little bit of a story. So this is story time with, with Dan, okay? So we're going to be talking about how we could do all of this now using this sort of analogy. Now, I use the maze specifically because I like to use the story of the Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. So I like to explain this in my fun, unique way. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> so anyways, suppose that you are going to enter this labyrinth. Suppose it's far more complex than just this. But for our purposes, it's easy enough to just imagine you have this right here as our maze. Now, 
Suppose that you are Theseus and you're entering into this great, deep, overly complicated labyrinth. Yes, dance, magic, dance. Dance, magic, dance. Some will catch that. Um, the point is, is that I would like to be able to explore this maze so that I don't get lost. Now, to put this all on a cherry on top, I gotta tell you a little bit about a story with this, just to contextualize this. So in the story of Theseus and the Minotaur, just to give you kind of like the brief version, in the only way that I could have fun with. Uh, so in the story, on Crete, there's this king, King Minos. And in the story, King Minos is offered a white bull from Poseidon. And in typical Greek fashion, he's supposed to do something with this white bull. Now, the thing is, is that King Minos decided, hey, look, this white bull, really awesome stuff. I'm not going to sacrifice or do whatever Poseidon would like me to do with this white bull. So instead of doing that, he decides to hang on to it. And Poseidon didn't like this. <laughs> so through something Poseidon might do, Poseidon causes Poseidon's wife to fall in love with the white bull. And don't ask me how that works, by the way. The, the point is, is that, is that I, I, listen, I'm not even going to go into all the gory details, but let's just say it involves a woodcrafted cow that, that King Minos' wife crawls into, that's, and the white bull and her do the thing. Like I said, I, I don't want you to go into all those fun details. <laughs> so the point is, is that it birthed the Minotaur. The half man, half bull. And in his embarrassment, King Minos puts the Minotaur in this deep, complicated labyrinth. And the question is, okay, so what is he going to do with this labyrinth? It's almost like King Minos' embarrassment that he has this Minotaur, right? It's his shame. So, in, later on, there was this exchange that was happening between Athens and Crete, where they essentially would offer maidens and young men to the to Crete where they would go into this labyrinth where they they'd get eaten by the Minotaur. Really grim stuff, right? And Theseus found out about this whole process, and like I said, I'm not gonna go into all of the details, and he was gonna go slay the Minotaur. So a natural question is: well, how does he do that? Well, with the help of King Minos' daughter Ariadne, Ariadne who was besmirched by Theseus, uh, offers Theseus a solution to not get lost in the labyrinth. It's very simple. What Ariadne does is offer Theseus a ball of string. I know it's not quite a ball, but we'll go with it. <laughs> so what, what, what she suggests is that, hey, look, at the entrance of the labyrinth, I want you to take this string and tie it at the entrance. And that way, if you're exploring the labyrinth, you can just unravel the string. And say if you ever get lost in the labyrinth, you could just roll it back up and find your way back to the entrance. Does everybody get the main idea here? So what Theseus is going to do in our analogy is Theseus is going to, whenever Theseus visits a brand new place in this labyrinth, he's going to mark the vertex. And whenever Theseus is going to consider an incident edge, a new passageway in the labyrinth, it's going to label it. Now, the great thing is that Theseus really likes to use really long, large writing and puts really big X's on the walls so that Theseus can see where he was previously. So Theseus will know when I've already been down a passageway um, that brings me somewhere I've already been versus being at a passage that I've never seen before versus a passage that I have not yet been down, but I can clearly see that I've already been wherever the other side of that passage is. Is that clear, everybody? So for example here, Theseus may start to tie that string off at A here, at U, and begin to go down to H. So Theseus would unroll the string after marking here at A, it goes to H. And he sees there's no more passages. 
So what does Theseus do? Rolls that back up to get it back to A. So this is actually how we're going to process the graph with depth first search. So I think it's a good idea we kind of go through this idea together. Now you might ask Dan, what is exactly is the string in this whole process? Now, let me just show you how this would play out. So, so suppose that I am at A, so that I, suppose I start this process at A. I would mark there. Remember, I want to explore the labyrinth. Maybe I might run into the Minotaur. Who knows, the Minotaur may not even be there. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Minotaur is an I. I don't know. The point is, is that Theseus is going on an exploration to explore the labyrinth. So, and I must stress, by the way, if we did run into the Minotaur and we wanted to, say, compute the pathway to get from the start point to the Minotaur, once we find the Minotaur, we already actually have a lot of information to actually know how to find the Minotaur afterwards. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that after. So if I go to A, suppose that I were to go down to H like we talked about before. Actually, let me use a different color. I was going to use red, but let's go green. I go down to H. Well, you can imagine my string. Imagine my string here. Suppose I have, I start off at A and I go to H. So I roll out the string and I get to H. Notice that when I get to H, I'm going to mark it there. And then I consider all of the edges, the other passageways I could go down. But notice I've, I have already gone down all of them, right? This edge is already, this passageway, I've already labeled it, right? So that means there's nothing else to do here. So I'm going to roll back up my string and go back to A. So now I'm back at A. So you can think of this as I'm unwinding. Now I'm going to look at my next passageway. So I'm going to roll out the string. But notice that I do not see that the other side of the passageway has been marked. So I'm going to go down that way. And now, hey, look, I'm here now. So I'm going to mark that. And now I'm going to go down a new passage. Now, keep in mind that if I can find one, I'll most certainly do it. I'm going to go depth-wise into the labyrinth. But the thing is, the string is going to help me know to make sure how to get back afterwards. So suppose that Theseus goes down this way. Well, what did I say? When we get onto the other side, I unwind my string. I'm going to mark it. And then I'm going to look for any incident edges, other passageways. Notice that I've already gone down this one. So I'm going to definitely consider this one instead. Notice there's only really one option here. So I'm just going to keep going. So I'm going to mark D. And now I'm going to go down another passageway. Notice that I can take this one right here. Notice that this isn't labeled yet. And also notice that the other endpoint of this passageway isn't been really, it hasn't been marked, right? So I most certainly can go down this way and I'll find something new. I'll discover something. So I'm going to mark E. Now, I have a lot of choices here. Now, I could go down to F, I could go to G, or I could go to B. Now, in depth first search, it doesn't matter which way you go. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter which passageway you take. Uh, there is a simple mechanism to prevent you from revisiting places you already went. Let me give you an example of this. So notice that Theseus already put a marked a big X over here on this intersection here at B. So Theseus already knows, hey, look, I shouldn't go up back up to B from here because I'll get back there if I, un if I roll back up the string, right? The string will take me all the way back this way, right? So Theseus is going to label this edge or passageway with a different color instead because that will just send me back to where I used to be, right? So... Then Theseus can say, hey, look, I already went that, I'm, I've, read, I've already been over there. There's nothing to discover over there. So Theseus instead goes down this way. Wait, let me just make sure I got my thread up to date. So I got E over here. And now we're going to roll out the string to go to F. Well, what do I do with F? I'm going to mark it. And then I'm going to consider my incident edges. So notice that I have 
the green one I've already been to, right? So that doesn't matter. Uh, this one here. Let's go along this edge to G. And now we're at G, right? So I've ruled out my string all the way to G. Do you see that the string corresponds to whatever I'm currently rolled out as? Looks like this right now, where it's where I'm at G, I would go back through F, E, D, C, B, and then A. If I unwind the string like this, that'll be take me right back to the entrance. Did everybody see that? Now, notice here that at G, I have another one of these passageways. Well, if I went that way, well, I will just go back to E, but the thing is, I already know I'll eventually go back to E if I just wind back up my string, right? So I'm going to label this in this manner because I, I know I'm not going to go. I don't need to go back that way because I'm just going to wind up my string and I'll anyway get back to E eventually, right? Now I must stress as well, there might be multiple passageways that I may actually go down like this where I have to unwind back up my string and then go down another pathway. So this example, well... Well, rather simple, I must stress that it's possible that you may unwind this, then there might be another pathway you might go down. The point is, is whatever currently is going on with my string, it looks like this. Now, does anybody know what kind of data structure, if you were to look at this right here, there's a, there's a nice, an interesting basic data structure that looks just like this. Where notice every single time I examine a new, a new vertex, new uh, intersection or dead end, I put it on the top of this. And whenever I run out of options, I take it off. Well, let me show you how this gets wound up again. So watch this. So I'm going to wind up my string. Well, notice that I've examined all the incident edges here. They're all labeled, right? So it means I, I'm done at G. So let's go back to F. Well, F, I've already examined everything at F, right? Well, now I could go back. I'm going to roll this back up. Now I'm at E. I could roll this back up. I could roll this back up from D up to C. I could roll this back up now from B. And there I am at. I'm at A again. And notice I've considered all of the edges incident on each one of my vertices. And when I've done this, I've returned back to the entrance, safe and sound. So, has anybody figured out what exactly is going on with this, 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 uh, this representation of my string? It's actually a stack. So this is actually, in data structures, you'd call this a stack. And this mechanism is actually facilitated if you were to write out this algorithm, it's, you could naturally write it as a recursive algorithm where the stack is built right into your system, just as an example. But you can make your own stack like this. So anyways, that's actually how depth for search works. So one thing I want to point out while I'm here before we get into the actual algorithm description is that there's two kinds, did you see, okay, notice first that all of these X's are on all of the vertices reachable from my starting vertex, right? Notice that I doesn't ever, because we don't have any pathway to I, right? Furthermore, notice that the green edges, whenever we labeled with a green edge, that meant that the opposing endpoint was not marked, right? when the opposing endpoint was already marked, I used red, right? We actually have names for these kinds of edges. They have a very nice property. So the green edges, so these ones right here, and as I lose markers, so the green edges here, we call these discovery or forward edges. So discovery, sometimes these are also called forward edges. And likewise, the red edges, as I suggested, are called back edges.
So they're called back edges. Because they don't, they, they, we, we label them as back edges because if we were to take them, it will take us back to somewhere that we already were. So keep in mind, we just follow, we can follow back through the green edges to get back to that vertex. Anyways, there's no point in going down that route. So hopefully that's clear, everybody. Yes, yes, that, I'm going to be talking all about that. Right? Wonderful, ob actually, it's a really nice observation. Notice that that is actually something, actually, I'll mention it now. So notice here that those green edges, they, spo they form a very nice structure. They form one, not only what we call a tree, but it spans all of the vertices that are reachable from you. So all those green edges, indeed, they form a spanning tree of forward edges. So we would actually call this a spanning tree in the truest sense if the graph was connected. Notice that we can't reach eyes. Notice that, so if we look at this given, given spanning subgraph, the one where only we consider those that are reachable from you, it would be a spanning tree, exactly. So let me give you the pseudocode now for depth first search. Very natural stuff, right? So let's try out an algorithm for this. Then we'll talk about how we can analyze it. And then we'll see some properties. So I really like the observation that was pointed out. That's wonderful. So let's talk about, talk about the algorithm. And there's some nice properties that this algorithm actually has that we're going to see some ways we can use it. I'll mention maybe one or two of them. I'll have more details uh, in my notes, but most certainly uh, we'll talk about those actually in the future. So we're going to call this DFS, and it's going to be given a starting vertex. So as input, we're given a vertex U which is one of the vertices in the graph. And I'm gonna just presume for the sake of our discussion that this graph is already connected, meaning that you won't have a vertex like vertex I, like in our example. It means that when we, re re every vertex is reachable from the starting vertex. So vertex U of a connected graph G, which is going to be equal to VE. And as output, now I must stress that this, the way I've written, going to describe this algorithm to you, it is not actually going to return anything. Instead, it's just going to modify the graph as represented. So it's just going to be what we would call a DFS traversal, a depth first search traversal. A traversal of G starting starting at you. So let's walk through the mindset that we had earlier on. Okay. So we had this, we have a starting vertex. Well, what was the thing we did every single time, right? We would mark the vertex and then we would examine all of the incident edges, right? And if we found an incident edge where the opposing endpoint was not marked, that's when we continued our search along, right? Otherwise, we would just label that edge as a back edge, right? So that's exactly what you're going to see happen here. I'm going to describe the algorithm recursively just because I think it looks pretty. But most certainly, you can easily take the same algorithm. If you want to replace this with iteration instead of recursion, just keep in mind what I said earlier, that you could just replace the recursion, which uses a, the call time or the uh, runtime stack, it uses, you could just use your own stack. So you're just gonna mark the vertex. And then for every incident edge, so I'm just gonna call for every edge of the form UV, where U is obviously the vertex that's being passed along. So we have to compute the incident edges of that vertex. We ask the question, if V is not, UV is not labeled. So if that's not labeled, then, so if it's not labeled, then we can ask the question, is the opposing endpoint marked or not? If it's the opposing endpoint is marked, then we know to use what kind of edge? 
a back edge or a forward edge? Forward or discovery edge? Well, let's consider the case when U is marked. So if U is marked, sorry, if V is marked, let's be a bit more precise here. We don't care if U is marked or not. It's V that we care about, right? So if that's the case, then what we're going to do is we're going to label this edge because if it's all marked on the other side, we never went down that route, right? That means that we're going to, to label it as a back edge, right? Then we label UV as a back edge. Otherwise, otherwise we have as follows. We're going to label that edge as a discovery edge or forward edge. I'll use the discovery edge just for the steaming of our fun here. So we're going to label it as a discovery edge. And then we just recursively apply DFS on the opposing endpoint, V. And I think I need one more. There we go. So that's DFS, where we're giving a start and start vertex here. So let me just grab a different marker here. Okay, so are there any questions about DFS or is this pretty clear? So it's just the exact idea we've been using in our example and on the same idea we use to explore the maze, right? The labyrinth. I assure you I will not wear the tight David Bowie pants, okay? So I will, I will, I will hold off on that for today. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, so this is DFS here. I thought it'd be a good idea we just do the... Let's do a time complexity analysis. So let's talk about that. So I'll have a bit more of the details in the, in the notes here, but let's walk through this. So I told you that marking a vertex can be done in constant time, right? So this is gonna take some C1 many operations. I'll use a different color to help indicate the parts of the algorithm. So let's use a blue marker. So C1 many operations, some constant number of operations are needed to mark that vertex. Then, the next what we have, well we have everything inside of here, right? But now notice that this is a recursive algorithm. Now. Notice that there's a recursive call right there. Now, a common technique for analyzing recursive algorithm is to start off by ignoring the recursion first, formulating what the time complexity would be without the recursion, and then incorporating the recursion in. For example, how many recursive calls are happening each time, how big are the sizes of the instances. So in this case, let's, let's kind of do that. So we're going to start, we're going to ignore the recursion. So please keep this in mind. We're going to ignore the recursion. That's a little squeaky. We're going to ignore the recursion. So that means that this line right here in the algorithm, it I presume it takes constant time. So that means that all of this, so remember I have an if statement, I check if it's not labeled. Since I have access to the edge object, I do not need to worry about lookup times other than it being taking constant time, because I have direct access to it. Uh, checking if it's if this is marked, constant time. Labeling an edge, constant time. Then we just have this call, but we presume that recur we're going to ignore the recursion for now. So it means that all of this takes, takes some C2 many operations, right? Naturally. What's we only all have really one part I have not yet incorporated. It's the loop here. Do you see this loop is still we still have not accounted for this. So we're gonna take everything inside the loop in combination with what's what's on the outside here. And that's actually how we're gonna formulate our complexity function. And once we have that, then we can play around with it based on how we represent the graph. So notice that the question is okay, so we have to determine 
this right here. Well, it's the number, so, so presume it's just some number. For our purposes, we're going to go into some more detail. But for us, it's just as simple. It's just going to be the number of iterations times C2. Because for each iteration of this loop, it performs C2 many operations. What this will be depends on how we represent the graph. So now we can come together and try to formulate a complexity function. Then we're going to look at how, depending on we represent the graph, comes to our result for the time complexity of the algorithm. So, so notice I have C1. So it's really just two pieces here. It's nice and simple. We have C1 plus number of iterations times C2. So let's write that over here. And let's figure out what's going to happen when we think about each representation. So for one call of DFS, you have it where it's C1 plus C2 times the number of iterations of that loop over there. But there's a very nice property of DFS. Did you notice that we only call DFS recursively only in one situation? And let me, let me just explain this in a very simple way for us. Okay. So suppose that I have this bucket here. And this consists of all of the marked vertices in the graph. Now, suppose that all of these represent the unmarked vertices. Do you notice that in DFS over there, the one we just looked at, notice that every time I mark a vertex, it goes into this bin. It never comes back out of the bin. Why? It's because whenever we examine the opposing endpoint of an unlabeled edge, we consider two cases, right? When it is, of course, the opposing endpoint is marked, we label as a back edge. When it isn't, we label as discovery or forward edge. But in that situation, what did we do? We, that's, when, that's the only time we ever call DFS on the opposing endpoint. But that means that every single time I do this, suppose that these are all of these hypothetical vertices that you haven't yet reached. They're all going to go into this bucket, but they're never going to come out of the bucket. So if you actually think about it, every time I mark a vertex, it's like I'm just taking each one of the vertices and I'm just tagging them off and saying, there's going to be at most one time I'm ever going to mark a vertex. That's the big thing I really want you to notice. So what does that mean? So here's the big observation. So here's the observation. The algorithm visits algorithm visits every vertex in G, presuming of course it's connected, right? In G exactly once. Exactly once. Thus, how many recursive calls happen, or how many calls just generally happen? The number of calls is dependent on the number of vertices in the graph. So the number of calls is the number of vertices. So that means our complexity function looks like this. It means, so this is the complexity function. So here's the complexity function. So for each one of the vertices in the graph, you're going to perform these number of operations. C1 plus C2 times the number of iterations. So that's what the complexity function looks like. Now, now, now that we have this, and you might ask, Dan, why didn't you just make it n times this? Well, you're going to see very carefully that in one situation, your observation is exactly correct. 
in the other version of this, it, it's actually helpful to write it like this. So it's best I just keep it general now and then I specialize later. So there's two ways I could represent this graph that I've talked about, the adjacency matrix and the adjacency list. So let's talk about how this plays out for each one. So I'm going to keep this brief here. I'll have more details in my notes. So for the adjacency matrix, please notice that to compute the incident edges over there. So when I look at my loop over there, I go and try to compute the incident edges. That's really what I'm doing. But in an adjacency matrix, just as a reminder, you have it where you have, imagine you have an N by N table and to examine a row to determine which edges are my incident edges I need to go across a row in the matrix but what's one dimension of the matrix it's the number of vertices right and in the worst case that means you're gonna have to look at every one of the entries in that matrix so computing the incident edges in that case uh, so so to consider the incident edges, to compute, consider the incident edges, uh, we must, in the worst case, in the worst case, examine examine n entries in a row of the matrix right as let's write of let's go in in a row of the matrix Therefore, therefore, the worst case time complexity the worst case time complexity I'm sort of crunching it all in one spot here. Worst case time complexity is as follows. So notice that the number of iterations here is n because it'll take you linear time to compute that. It'll take the number of iterations is going to, to, to augment that for the adjacency matrix over there. You're going to need to traverse a row. So that means the time complexity is going to look like this. So let's specialize it now. So for each vertex in V, we have it where we have C1 plus C2 times N, right? Because it's N. Number of iterations is N in this case. Let's see. Okay, well, I have n vertices, right? So now I'm going to just pull that in. So now I have c1 times n plus c2 times n squared. But this is big O of n squared. Which, if you think about it, if the graph is dense, meaning it has many edges, that's perfectly appropriate, right? So that's what you'd get with an adjacency matrix. Let's talk about an adjacency list now. So with the adjacency list, it's, a it's just a little different, but it relies on your understanding of how we can compute the incident edges in an adjacency list. So in an adjacency list, however, Notice that to access the incident edges, we have actually have access to that information in an adjacency list. It's simply in one of the linked lists that comprises the adjacency list. So just as a reminder, this here's a little doodle just to help you remind you of this. So if I look at any one adjacency, one linked list or list or secondary data structure that's storing the incident edges, suppose it's this one right here. Remember, each one of the nodes is for one of my neighbors, each incident edge in our case. So 
The number of these corresponds to the degree of a vertex. So to traverse through each one of these nodes, for example, I would have to go through this list. Well, how long is the list? Now, if I was being very naive, I would just tell you, oh, well, all of the vertices could be in that list. That's true, but there's a much more precise way, as I said. So, so to scan a list, requires traversing, traversing the degree of u vertices or elements. We'll say elements here. So this is where this is why I wrote this in a specific way to be very helpful. So we just grab a different marker. I'm just I'm just going through markers like crazy. Woo! It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> So we got ourselves the following. So now well, all we're going to do is we're going to replace number of iterations with the degree of u. Because that's the number of iterations. Is you have to go through one of those lists when you specialize this. So therefore, the worst case time complexity is is as follows so watch this carefully so i'm going to go i have something over all the vertices c1 plus c2 times the degree of u now notice that the c1 only depends on the number of vertices right it doesn't it, notice that u is the only thing that really depends on this sum right so i'm just going to pull that out to the side so I'm going to have C1 times N, like I did before. Notice every time I have this in the sum, it's just C2 times whatever I'm adding. So I just go C2 times the sum over all the vertices. And each one is the degree of that vertex. But here's the catch. Here's the catch. One of our best friends pops up here. This looks like something we've talked about before. That right there is the sum of the degrees of the graph, right? But what's this? What is this equal to? We have our friend, right? The handshaking lemma. The handshaking lemma tells us that this is exactly equal to twice the number of edges. So this is by the handshaking lemma. So this is C1 times N plus C2 times 2M. And if you look at this, you're like, okay, well, what's the big O here? Well, notice I have an N there and I have an M here. So I'm going to suppress the constants and I'm just going to proceed as follows. Which, and I end up getting big O of N plus M. So this is linear in the size of the graph. The number of vertices, number of edges. So this is the time complexity when you represent it as an adjacency list. Yeah, so notice exactly. So notice that, now notice that if you, so keep in mind, I'm going to write it like this, but I must stress that if you have many more edges than vertices, it would just be big old M, right? And so, so I must stress that uh, this is just meant to be clear, so that way we have what N is and M are. Keep in mind that there could be very, very few edges in the graph. I'm just going to keep it general here, but I must stress that if you know more about your graph, you can tailor this even further. For example, just to give you a quick example of what I mean by this, suppose that you knew, um, yeah, yeah, this is actually big theta. So that is indeed a big theta. Uh, I'm just keeping it simple with big O here, but most certainly it is a big theta. Uh, so let's uh, so let me just make one example of this, and this is actually something I've talked about in the past. Is that suppose you're given a kind of graph where the number of edges is very few. It is what we'd call sparse. So a sparse graph, for example, is one where the number of edges is big O of n. Something roughly this. In particular, there are certain kinds of graphs that have this property, where the number of edges, so the number of edges 
is big O of n. So you, you might know some examples of graphs that are like this. For example, a tree has this property. Um, there's uh, what we call planar graphs. I talked about those in the past. Uh, planar graphs, those also are sparse like this. But if you're given a graph that's like this, notice that the m here, you can replace that with an n. So that means that the, the algorithm runs in big O of n, or even big theta of n, in those specific kinds of graphs. Pretty nice, right? One other thing I also want to point out is that if your graph is dense, notice that this n here, notice that m here will be approaching n squared. So you end up getting big O of n squared, just like you had in the earlier case. So there's a nice connection between the density of a graph, or how dense the graph is, versus how sparse it is. And there's a lot you could go into in detail about this, but most certainly that's one thing I wanted to point on. This is actually the main reason why I wrote it out like this. So one last thing I wanted to talk about here, at least for DFS, we're gonna keep talking about some more stuff here, is I wanted to talk about something I alluded to earlier on, is what exactly do you do with a graph that you know for certain is not connected? So how exactly do you get DFS to work in those cases? <laughs> so it's actually really straightforward. This is actually why I introduced the concept of graph traversal in the way I did, is that if ever you needed to say, re-examine from another starting vertex, you just apply the algorithm again. So, so how can we ensure the graph visits every vertex in your graph? So under the presumption that the graph is connected, implying that there is a path between any two vertices, um, DFS on a single vertex will get everything, meaning you'll compute and process the entire graph. However, if it's disconnected, meaning that there exists more than what we call connected components, then we have to be a bit more careful. So, you're going to look at this next one more as a generalization. So suppose that you need to have it where you start up the algorithm again and again and again. What, how, how, what's an easy way of doing that? So, so how to process the graph if disconnected? So I have some good news for you, is that it doesn't make any difference from a complexity standpoint by adding this extra bit of work. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference from a complexity standpoint. But it looks like this. So all you're going to do is, if you have any vertices that are not yet marked, just simply run DFS on that unmarked vertex. So you just simply go through each one of the vertices, and you just simply say, hey, look, is it marked? If it's not marked, run DFS on it. So you just, that's basically the idea. It's nice and simple. So let me just give you the kind of the quick way of looking at this. So I'm also going to put in a lot of the bookkeeping stuff. So suppose that you wanted to have this thing clean up the graph every time you wanted to run DFS. I'm going to throw that in here too. So this would be DFS where I pass you a graph. So for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to ignore the input output, just presume it's a graph and presume that the vertices can be marked and the edges can be labeled. And it's just going to do a DFS traversal of the entire graph. So I'm just going to throw some bookkeeping in here. So meaning that you're just going to make sure that the graph is nice and clean, just in case there's anything that's been mutated about the markings. So for each vertex in the graph, you're going to do the following. You're just going to simply set, set V as unmarked. So you're just going to make sure it's not marked. And then for each one of the edges, for each edge, for each one of the edges, make sure you, you um, so make sure E is not labeled. So just make sure it doesn't have a label on it. Sorry, labeled, labeled. Gotta be careful with these little things. Um, next, 
Now, this is the part that really matters here. For each vertex v, v in v, you're going to do the following. So if the vertex v is not marked, if v is not marked, is v is not marked, then all you're going to do is you're just going to apply DFS on v. So all you do is you just add in this, and this will ensure your graph is going to be all nice and clean so that when you run DFS, you're not going to have it where marks already exist. Um, likewise, this will make sure there's no labels that are already on the edges. But the part that really matters here is this last loop right here. You might ask Dan, what's the time complexity here? It's the exact same as what I had over here, believe it or not. So for an adjacency matrix, it's big O of n squared or big theta n squared. Um, for the adjacency list, it's big theta of n plus m. Now you might ask Dan, why is that the case? Well, remember in our previous analysis, we presumed the graph was connected. If the graph is disconnected, that means that when we went through that same analysis over there, that means that we were actually counting up the number of vertices and edges or the degrees of vertices and edges even with respect to only one connected component. Because whenever you run DFS, on a given vertex that isn't marked, notice that when you start this process up, you're not going into a connected component that's already been explored, right? You're going to this completely new stuff where you're gonna look at vertices that have already not been marked yet. Like remember what we talked about earlier, They're already, those ones are already in here. The ones that this additional calls are gonna make are gonna be dealing with other unmarked vertices. Very neat, right? So, so that's DFS.